The year is 1941, and journalists crowd around a concrete apron at Langley as test pilot Philip Lucas advances the throttles on a Hawker Typhoon. What happens next defies everything the aviation world thought possible. The engine doesn't just roar, it screams with a sound that rattles bones and shakes the ground like approaching thunder. This isn't the smooth purr of a Merlin or the steady growl of an Allison. This is something primal, something dangerous. The Napier Sabre, a 24-cylinder monster producing over 2,000 horsepower, even in its troubled early form, represents the most ambitious liquid-cooled engine ever attempted. Engineers watch with barely concealed anxiety as the aircraft accelerates down the runway, knowing that inside the cowling lies an engineering marvel so complex, so temperamental, that it nearly destroyed the companies that built it. This wasn't just another power plant competing for contracts, it was aviation's most audacious gamble given physical form, a design that asked a simple question, what if we threw away every rule about piston engine design and started from scratch? The old guard faces obsolescence. For two decades, British aviation had been defined by the graceful designs of Rolls-Royce. The Merlin engine powered Spitfires and Hurricanes with aristocratic reliability, a testament to conservative engineering that valued refinement over raw aggression. These engines were the thoroughbreds of the sky, elegant machines that represented everything civilized about British engineering culture. Then came the Focke Wolf 190 in late 1941, arriving over the channel like a messenger from an unwelcome future. German engineers had created something brutally efficient, an air-cooled radial that outperformed the RAF's finest with embarrassing ease. British pilots found themselves outclassed, their Spitfire MKVs suddenly looking like outdated technology facing an inevitable future. Napier and Company, the storied engineering firm that had been building power plants since 1808, watched this technological shift with growing alarm. The company had been overshadowed by Rolls-Royce for years, relegated to second-tier contracts and experimental work that never quite reached the glory of their competitors. The firm's leadership understood that the war would be won or lost based on horsepower, and they asked the question that would define their wartime legacy. What if we stopped trying to make engines more refined and instead made them incomprehensibly powerful? What if we built something so radical that it would rewrite the rules of aerial combat? The brutal lessons of the dagger. Napier's engineers, many of them former Royal Navy specialists accustomed to marine engine design, where size and weight mattered less than absolute power, had already tested their radical philosophy with the Napier dagger. That 24-cylinder engine had been their first attempt at breaking conventional limits, an H configuration design that produced impressive power on paper, but proved nearly impossible to keep running in actual service. Test pilots who flew aircraft equipped with the dagger described the experience like trying to tame a wild animal that might turn on you without warning. The engine ran dangerously hot, vibrated so violently it cracked instrument panels, and had a disturbing tendency to throw connecting rods through the crankcase at maximum power settings. One RAF evaluation report called it fundamentally unsuitable for military service due to chronic unreliability. Critics within the Air Ministry dismissed it as typical Napier overreach, brute force engineering without the sophistication that made Rolls-Royce engines legendary. Inside Napier's Acton Works, engineers held heated debates about whether they should abandon the H configuration entirely and pursue conventional designs that the Air Ministry would actually trust. The dagger had taught them hard lessons about the nightmarish challenges of cooling 24 cylinders arranged in four rows, about the destructive harmonics that could shake an airframe apart about the exotic metallurgy required to contain combustion pressures that would shatter conventional materials. But here's where the story takes an unexpected turn. While everyone focused on the dagger's public failures, a small design team was already working on its successor, incorporating every painful lesson learned from those disastrous test flights. They called it Project S-A-B-R-E, and it would make the dagger look like a cautious experiment by comparison. The Sleeve Valve Gamble. The decision that changed everything came in 1936, when Napier's designers made a choice that would define the Sabre's entire troubled development. Sleeve valves instead of conventional poppet valves. This technology, licensed from Bristol's Roy Fedden, who had pioneered the concept, represented a fundamental reimagining of how internal combustion engines could work. To understand why this mattered, you need to understand the bottleneck that limited all high-performance engines of the era. At extreme power settings, conventional poppet valves become the limiting factor their mechanical complexity restricting how much air and fuel you can force through the cylinders per second. Sleeve valves, thin steel cylinders that rotated around each piston to open and close ports eliminated that restriction entirely. The engineering philosophy was explicit. 
Napier valued volumetric efficiency and maximum power density above reliability, simplicity, and ease of maintenance. They were building an engine for total war, where performance during brief combat engagements mattered more than longevity or logistical convenience. The H-24 configuration with sleeve valves meant the Sabre could theoretically produce horsepower numbers that seemed impossible for an engine of its displacement. 24 cylinders arranged in four banks of six, each bank fed by a sophisticated two-speed supercharger that could force air into the combustion chambers at pressures approaching 10 pounds per square inch. Early dyno tests revealed something extraordinary, smooth power delivery combined with output figures that exceeded anything Rolls-Royce had achieved but the reality of turning theoretical performance into operational reliability would prove far more challenging than anyone anticipated. The Hidden Crisis Here's what Napier couldn't afford to reveal during those critical meetings in 1939 when Hawker was betting their entire fighter program on the Sabre. The sleeve valve system, for all its theoretical advantages, demanded manufacturing precision that Britain's industrial infrastructure simply couldn't deliver consistently. Each sleeve valve required tolerances measured in thousandths of an inch, operating temperatures that pushed the limits of available alloys and lubrication systems that needed to function perfectly at altitudes where conventional oils turned to gel. The earliest production engines suffered catastrophic failures at alarming rates. Connecting rods shattered under loads that exceeded design calculations. Sleeve valves seized at high altitude when thermal expansion exceeded microscopic clearances. Cooling systems proved inadequate for the tremendous heat generated by 24 cylinders firing at combat power. Squadron leader Roland Bimon, one of the first operational pilots to fly the Typhoon, later recalled that advancing the throttle felt like being kicked in the spine by an invisible giant, assuming that giant didn't kill you when the engine exploded. Napier hid the truth about the failure rates during early testing because they understood the terrible calculus of war. The Air Ministry desperately needed to believe in the SABRE because without it, Britain would face the Luftwaffe's next generation with inadequate power plants. So Napier's engineers pressed forward through 18-hour days and seven-day weeks, fixing problems one crisis at a time, hoping they could solve the fundamental issues before the mounting casualties forced the Air Ministry to cancel the entire program. The turning point. The breakthrough came not from a single innovation, but from hundreds of small improvements accumulated through brutal trial and error. By late 1942, Napier had redesigned the lubrication system three times, modified the supercharger drive to reduce harmonic vibration, and developed new chrome-plated sleeves that could withstand the thermal stress of sustained combat power. They increased the cooling capacity of the radiator system by 40%, reworked the cylinder head design to improve heat dissipation, and implemented quality control procedures that caught manufacturing defects before engines reached squadron service. The Sabre II that emerged from this crucible of refinement finally delivered on the original promise. Test pilots reported a surge of acceleration that transformed the Typhoon from a questionable interceptor into something approaching a revelation. Advancing the throttle produced 2,200 horsepower initially, with war emergency power pushing that figure toward 2,400. This wasn't just incremental improvement over the Merlin. This was a different category of performance entirely, turning the massive Typhoon into an aircraft that could dive at speeds exceeding 500 miles per hour and maintain combat effectiveness while carrying ordnance loads that would cripple lighter fighters. Birth of the Typhoon The Napier Sabre in its mature form became the most powerful production piston engine to see widespread service during World War II, eventually reaching 3,500 horsepower in the Sabre 7 variant that arrived too late to see combat. To put that in perspective, the legendary Merlin that powered Spitfires produced around 1,500 horsepower. The Sabre wasn't just more powerful, it operated in an entirely different realm of performance. By 1943, Typhoons equipped with the refined Sabre, two were devastating German armored columns across France. The aircraft could carry 2,000 pounds of bombs or eight rocket projectiles and still maintain fighter performance, transforming it into the most feared ground attack platform in the European theater. The sound became instantly recognizable to troops on the ground, a distinctive crackling roar produced by the exhaust stubs of 24 cylinders firing in precise sequence. German soldiers called it Jabos, a contraction that carried both respect and dread. The visual signature was equally unmistakable. That massive chin radiator housing, the thick elliptical wings, the sheer bulk of an aircraft that looked less like a fighter and more like a battering ram with wings. The devil in the details. Operational reality meant constant maintenance battles that ground crews learned to wage with grim determination. The Sabre required attention like a temperamental racing engine, constant monitoring of sleeve valve lubrication, cooling system health, and the maddening complexity of keeping 24 cylinders firing in perfect harmony. 
RAF mechanics nicknamed various components with creative profanity that reflected both affection and exhaustion. Aviation journalists called it revolutionary, while pilots called it a handful, especially during those early operational months when engine failures remained disturbingly common despite all the improvements. Yet in combat over Normandy and the German industrial heartland during 1944, the Typhoon became legend. Rocket-armed Typhoons could penetrate Tiger tank armor, could dive through defensive flak that would shred lighter aircraft, could maintain lethal accuracy at treetop level where precision mattered more than altitude. The Hawker Tempest, which appeared in 1944 as the Sabre's final evolution, combined that brutal power with aerodynamic refinement that made it one of the fastest piston fighters ever built. Tempests became the only Allied aircraft capable of consistently catching and destroying V-1 flying bombs, pursuing the German cruise missiles at speeds exceeding 400 miles per hour at low altitude. Export Dreams and Reality International interest in the Sabre never materialized in the way Napier hoped, the Royal Canadian Air Force evaluated license production, viewing it as Canada's contribution to Commonwealth air power, but the complexity proved prohibitive for wartime expansion. Every Sabre required hand fitting of sleeve valves by skilled technicians, specialized training that took months to complete, and logistics that made even the notoriously complicated Allison engines look straightforward. American military evaluators in the Pacific Theater briefly considered it as a power plant for long-range escort fighters, recognizing that the horsepower could push heavy fighters to speeds that might match Japanese interceptors. But commanders in the Far East rejected it after cursory evaluation, understanding that an engine requiring such intensive maintenance would never survive in jungle conditions where spare parts arrived by convoy and mechanics worked through monsoons in improvised facilities. The Sabre remained almost exclusively a Royal Air Force engine, a uniquely British solution to European war that never found a home beyond the theater where it was born. The end of an era. Victory in 1945 arrived simultaneously with aviation's jet age, a transition that rendered even the most sophisticated piston engines obsolete almost overnight. The Gloucester Meteor had already demonstrated that turbojets represented the future, offering reliability and performance that piston engines could never match regardless of complexity or power. The Sabre's maintenance requirements transformed from acceptable wartime necessity into peacetime liability when budgets tightened and the RAF demanded economy over bleeding edge performance. The Korean War briefly suggested that piston fighters still had relevance, as Hawker Sea Furies proved effective in ground attack roles, but those aircraft used Bristol Centaurus radials rather than the temperamental Sabre. Napier themselves recognized the writing on the wall, shifting engineering resources toward turboprop designs that promised jet performance with propeller efficiency. Sabre production ended quietly in 1950, with the final engines representing the absolute pinnacle of British piston engine development. The Sabre 7, capable of nearly 4,000 horsepower for brief moments before components began failing from the stress, represented both triumph and eulogy for an era when engineers believed they could solve any problem with enough cylinders and sufficient determination. Legends never die. Surviving Sabre engines became museum pieces and restoration projects, revered like preserved Spitfires and rescued Lancasters. By the 1970s, aviation enthusiasts treated functioning examples with almost religious devotion. The Shuttleworth Collection and other preservation organizations maintained flying examples of SABRE-powered aircraft, each flight requiring weeks of preparation and teams of specialists. The rarity cannot be overstated. Of the approximately 5,000 Sabre engines produced during the war years, fewer than two dozen complete engines survive today in museums and private collections worldwide. The Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon displays a cutaway Sabre that reveals the astonishing complexity of its internal architecture. 24 pistons arranged in an H configuration that still impresses modern engineers who examine it. The Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum preserves a Hawker Typhoon complete with its SABRE engine, one of only a handful of complete airframes that survived the post-war scrapping that claimed thousands of aircraft. In New Zealand, the Classic Fighters Organization maintains an airworthy Hawker Tempest, two powered by a meticulously restored Sabre engine, representing countless hours of detective work to source parts that haven't been manufactured in 70 years. Each public demonstration flight of this aircraft draws crowds in the thousands, people who come specifically to hear that distinctive 24-cylinder roar that defined an era. Private collectors have paid extraordinary sums for salvaged Sabre components, with complete rebuildable cores commanding prices exceeding two $100,000 at specialized auctions. The restoration process itself has become a specialized field, with perhaps only a dozen technicians worldwide who possess the knowledge to properly rebuild sleeve valve assemblies using techniques that combine traditional craftsmanship with modern metallurgical analysis. 
These specialists have documented their work in technical papers that analyze what went right and wrong with Napier's original design, creating a body of engineering literature that informs modern high-performance engine development. The fascination reignited among contemporary engineers who studied the Sabre sleeve valve technology with fresh appreciation, granted by hindsight, and advanced analysis tools unavailable during the war years. Computer modeling and finite element analysis revealed that Napier's fundamental concepts were remarkably sound, perhaps even ahead of their time by several decades. Modern material science and manufacturing precision could solve the metallurgical intolerance problems that plagued wartime production when factories were working under blackout conditions and material shortages forced compromises that engineers knew were dangerous. Universities including MIT and Cranfield have conducted research programs examining whether sleeve valve technology might have applications in modern internal combustion engines, finding that the theoretical advantages Napier pursued remain valid even in an era dominated by electronic fuel injection and variable valve timing. The direct lineage extends from the Sabre's uncompromising power philosophy in 1941 to modern racing engines that pursue identical goals. Maximum power density regardless of complexity or cost. Formula One engines producing over 1,000 horsepower per liter of displacement owe intellectual debt to the principles Napier established when they decided that complexity was acceptable and it delivered performance. The spirit of Napier's radical approach lives on in every engineer who asks whether the impossible might actually be achievable with enough courage and enough horsepower. Reflect on humanity's eternal obsession with flight, whether military or civilian, and the SABRE represents something profound about technological courage. The engine was more than a machine. It was a statement that Britain would not surrender the skies regardless of cost, that engineering audacity could overcome material disadvantages, that sometimes survival requires gambling everything on radical innovation that conventional wisdom says cannot work. Question to the audience. Would you have approved the Sabre program in 1936 knowing the challenges ahead, betting your nation's air superiority on an unproven technology when war was inevitable? Consider what might have been if Napier had succeeded in making the Sabre reliable earlier. The Typhoon had entered effective service in 1941 instead of mid-1942. If those thousands of horses had been available during the desperate summer of 1940. Aviation culture celebrates the Sabre precisely because it embodied risk as identity, complexity as allure. The willingness to build something impossibly ambitious even when every expert said it couldn't be done. That spirit defines every great aviation achievement from the Wright brothers to Apollo. The Sabre remains a testament to engineering courage in the face of overwhelming doubt. A reminder that sometimes the most important innovations come from those willing to ignore the limitations that everyone else accepts as inevitable.